All righty. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. All right. Cool. So um, today we're going to start with a review of power supplies. So we'll talk about the half wave supply, the uh, full wave, and then the full wave bridge supply. And then we'll go on to our main topic for our lecture, which is capacitors and inductors. So we'll talk about capacitors first. We'll talk about what they are, why they're important, and how they work. And then we'll go on and talk about the same things with inductors. And we'll also cover a formula that will allow you to calculate how much inductance a particular component has. Um, and then we'll do a preview of today's lab. So today's lab is pretty cool because in the lab today, you actually get to make your own components. So every one of you will get to make your own capacitor and inductor. So um, that should be pretty cool. We'll get to make them and then actually test them out and see how much capacitance and inductance they have. So that's the plan for today. Any questions before we get started? All right, cool. So let's start with our review of power supplies. So we said that um, a power supply, a DC power supply, is something that takes high voltage AC electricity and converts it into low voltage DC electricity. So basically, we, got, we start off with a wave that looks like this. We have high voltage AC electricity and we turn it into a wave that looks like this. So we've got lower voltage DC electricity that doesn't change over time. So that's what a power supply does. Um, I don't think I really talked too much about why it's so important, but basically the, the reason that it's so important is because this high voltage AC electricity is what we get out of the wall and the low voltage DC is what we need in order to power our electronics. Um, and so these types of power supplies are found um, all over the place. So um, if you have a, you know, a power supply that plugs into a wall, that's, uh, this is what's going on inside of it. So like the, the power supply for the camera back there that's plugged into the wall. It's one of those little power packs. You've probably seen them all over the place. Those um, are DC power supplies. Um, if you have a little USB charger that you plug into a wall, it's, a, it's an AC to DC power supply, just like this. Um, the, little, the little rectangular pack that you might have seen for a laptop that's in the middle of a laptop cord, that's a DC power supply like this too. So all of these different types of power supplies are DC power supplies that are, that are doing this. They're taking this high voltage AC electricity and converting it into low voltage DC. In fact, some light bulbs now have these power supplies built in. Has anybody seen a, um, a little LED light bulb at the store? You, or yeah, in a house. So you, you can see them now. They look pretty much like um, any old fashioned light bulb. They're the same basic shape. So, you know, it, it looks kind of like this. Um, but it is a, an LED bulb. So what's going on is that right up about here, there's a little panel inside the bulb that has the, the LEDs built into it. And that's a really small little panel. It's, you know, pretty thin and it just takes up that much room. And then most of the rest of the bulb is taken up by the power supply. So all this stuff down here, this area, is all taken up by a power supply that converts the high voltage AC electricity that comes from the wall into the low voltage DC that the LEDs need. So even light bulbs have these built in these days, okay? So that's why these, 
this concept is so important. These power supplies are everywhere. So let's talk a little bit about how it works. So basically, if we want to go from high voltage AC to low voltage DC, we don't do it in one big jump. We kind of sneak up on it. We do it in a couple of little steps. So the first step that we do is we take this high voltage AC and we turn it into lower voltage AC electricity. So same frequency, but lower voltage. And what kind of component will do that for us? That's right, a, a transformer. So um, we said that a transformer is a device that takes AC electricity and changes the voltage and current. So um, we use a transformer to go from high voltage AC into lower voltage AC. And then after that, we want to take this low voltage AC electricity and turn it into um, electricity that only has positive voltage. So um, a signal that might look something like this. So instead of having positive and negative voltages, now we only have the positive. Anybody remember what type of circuit we use to go from AC to, to only positive voltages? A That's right, a rectifier. So we use a rectifier circuit. And then we want to take this signal that's all positive but has these big dips in it and smooth it out a bit. So we want it to end up looking more like that. So um, the, the way that we do that is with filtering. And the simplest type of filter is a capacitor. So we use a capacitor. Um, to smooth this out. And then finally, we want to take this, this kind of mostly smooth wave and really give it, make it super flat. And the component that we would use for that is called a voltage regulator. So, we didn't talk too much about voltage regulators. We're not really going to get into them in this class, but that's the component that does that final smoothing. And we would talk more about those in ET322, which is sort of the next class in um, this series. So we can, we can do that. We can talk about them then um, if you're interested. So anyway, so this is the basic way that any DC power supply works and how it takes high voltage AC electricity and turns it into lower voltage DC, okay? So, um, so any questions about these basic steps? Okay, all right, and then um, we, this is kind of the general idea, but we looked at three specific types of power supplies last time. So the first type was called a half wave Recti um, yeah, half wave power supply. And really, the only thing that's different between these three types of power supplies is the type of rectifier that they use. All of them have the same transformer, they all have uh, well, actually, I take that back. One of them has a, a center tap transformer, right? But um, they all have a transformer. They all have a capacitor for smoothing. They could all have a voltage regulator. Really, the biggest difference is the type of rectifier that they use. And the, the rectifiers that they use have the same names as the power supplies themselves. So a half-wave power supply uses a half-wave rectifier. Full-wave power supply uses a full-wave rectifier. 
and same for full wave bridge, okay? So anyway, so the half wave power supply starts off with the transformer here. And then what component did we use for the half wave rectifier? Diode. Yep, exactly, just a diode, one diode. So this was the simplest type of power supply because it only used a single diode for its rectifier. So we had that, and then we had the load over here. And remember, the load was whatever we're trying to power. So this would be you know, our cell phone if we're charging that up, or the computer if we're, we're powering that, or whatever we're trying to, to actually do. So we had that, um, and then if we wanted to do some smoothing, we would put a capacitor in parallel here. Okay. Um, so that was the, the half-wave power supply. We said that if we had a signal, an AC signal coming in that was, say, 10 volts peak, and we looked at the output from our half-wave supply, would we get a signal when the, um, when the input was positive? Would we get a signal across our load? Yeah, exactly. So when the input was positive like this, um, we said the electricity would flow through this diode, and so it would um, power up the load. So we would get a, a signal that came up like this. Now, would it get all the way up to 10 volts peak? No, because we lose a little bit across that diode. So it would, we lose about, say, 0.7 volts across the diode. So that would mean we would get up to about 9.3 volts peak. So then, um, what about when the incoming signal was negative? Would we get any power for our load? No, because this diode blocks any electricity from flowing in the opposite direction. So, so we would get no power. So when, when the incoming signal um, went negative, the output across our load would just be flat. Okay? And then when the input went positive again, the output would go up, and so we'd get something like this. And then when the input was negative, it'd be flat again. So we get a signal that looks kind of like that. So this is why we call this a half-wave power supply, because it only captures the positive half of the incoming signal. Okay. So that's half-wave supply. And then if we put that um, capacitor in there to smooth things out, Initially, the capacitor would charge up as the power was going up, and then um, the capacitor would slowly discharge as the, the power was, um, when there was no incoming power, and then the capacitor would charge up again, and then slowly discharge, and so on. So you would get an output signal that looked something like that, okay? And in our labs, we built a power supply kind of like this, and we tested out different sizes of capacitors to see whether bigger capacitors or smaller capacitors worked best for smoothing. So, so which ones worked better, bigger ones or smaller ones? Bigger ones, exactly. Because the capacitor is acting kind of like a reservoir. Um, so if you have a really big reservoir, you can fill it up with lots of water, and then um, if you have to take some water during the rainy, you know, during the dry season, um, you, can, you can draw water from that reservoir, and the level doesn't go down very much because the reservoir is so big. If you have just a little tiny reservoir and you have to take water out of it, then that water level drops quite a bit more. Um, and it's the same thing with this capacitor. Bigger capacitors store more energy, um, so when you 
draw electricity from them, the voltage doesn't change very much. Okay, so bigger capacitors lead to smoother, um, smoother output waves. So then why wouldn't you just put like a, a huge capacitor, a 10, 10 farad capacitor in your power supply? You probably what? Well, right. So the the it would actually it would be a low pass filter because the high frequencies would go through to to ground. Right. And yeah. Um, but what what could be some other disadvantages of having a, a really huge capacitor? in a piece of electronic equipment. Yeah, exactly. Size and cost, right? You, you could get a capacitor, you know, this big, but you probably wouldn't want to have that inside your cell phone. It'd be a little bit bulky to carry around, right? And also, um, the, yeah, the cost. The bigger the capacitor is, the more expensive it is. And, you know, people don't like to pay that much for their electronics. So, so Many things in electronics are trade-offs, and this is one example. You can, the bigger the capacitor is, the smoother your wave is going to be, but um, the, the more expensive it is and the more size, more room it's going to take up. Yeah? Okay, so, so if you put capacitors in series, like that? Oh yeah, yeah, in parallel, right. So, um, so if you have two capacitors in parallel like this, um, it's it's essentially like having one larger capacitor. So, if you have two capacitors in parallel, they're v the total capacitance is just the sum of those two capacitors. So, so they add up almost like resistors in series. And it turns out that if you put capacitors in series, you have to use that, that weird formula like we do when we have resistors in parallel. So it's, it's sort of a weird, a weird thing like that. But yeah, that's, that's what happens. Okay. So that's the half wave power supply. So any questions about that? All right. So then um, we also talked about the full wave supply. And it, <laughs> one of the reasons that I'm spending time on these and, and talking about the differences here is because this is a type of question that might show up on the final exam on uh, some of those multiple choice questions that are going to be on the final. So it's important to be able to tell which of these power supplies is which. All right, so the full wave power supply It starts off with a transformer, just like before, but this was a special type of transformer in the full wave supply. What type of transformer was this? That's right, a center tap transformer. So it had this extra wire that came off the center of the secondary coil there. And then we used diodes again. How many diodes were there in the full wave rectifier? Two, right. So we had one up here and one down there. All right, and then we had the load over here. But then instead of wrapping around to the bottom of the transformer, now the, the load goes back to the center tap there. And then from the bottom diode, the wire comes up. It jumps over that 
wire and then goes up there. And then we could have that capacitor in parallel with our transformer again. Or, I'm sorry, with our load again. So, um, yeah. So that was the full wave power supply. And we said that for this one, if we look at our incoming voltage and it was, say, 10 volts peak again, Um, do we get an output signal when the input is positive? Yeah. Yep. Um, we get an output signal. Does it go all the way to uh, 10 volts like the input signal does? No. How, how high would the output go in this case? Seven. What's that? Point seven? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we would lose point 0.7 across one of these diodes, and we're not getting the full 10 volts like we were before. We're getting about half of that. So we're, we're only starting with 5 volts here, and we're losing point 0.7. So how much do we end up with? 4 .3. Yeah, 4.3, exactly. So, so the output signal looks something like that. It goes up to 4.3. 3 volts. And then um, when the input goes negative, the signal can go through this other diode, and so we still end up with about 4.3 volts coming out. So we call this a full wave um, power supply because it captures both the positive and the negative halves of the incoming signal. But the, the output is relatively low. Okay. And again, if we had that capacitor in there to smooth this out, then the capacitor charges up, and then it, it slowly discharges um, between these, these bumps here. So our output signal would look something like that if it was smoothed out. Okay. So any questions about the full wave supply? Okay. And then finally, the last type of supply we looked at was the full wave bridge supply. So again, we started off with the transformer. Did we have a normal transformer or a center tap transformer here? Normal, exactly. So we had this transformer, and then we have the, the bridge. Now, remember, a bridge in electronics is a circuit that has four components arranged in a diamond shape. So in this case, we're using four diodes, and um, they're all pointing more or less to the right side of the board here. And then we had our load over here. And we could put a capacitor in parallel with the load again, like that. All right, so that was our full wave bridge supply. And we said that the output from that if we had an incoming signal that was 10 volts peak again, um, the output signal would be um, it would be positive when the incoming signal was positive. Um, but in this case, we're going through two diodes every time um, that the, the power supply is on. So we lose 0.7 volts from each of those diodes, which is a total of 1.4 volts. So we started off with 10 volts, 
we go down by 1.4. So what is our output peak then? 8.6. 8.6, exactly. So, so we go up to about 8.6 volts peak on the output. And we get that when the incoming signal is positive and when it's negative. So our output looks something like that. And then if we have the capacitor there, that output signal gets smoothed out. Something like that. So, so if we, in terms of the signal smoothness, do you think it's better to have peaks happen more frequently or um, more slowly, like uh, on the half wave supply? Yeah, more frequently, exactly. Because when they happen slowly, there's a long time for that capacitor to discharge between these peaks. And the longer it has to discharge, the more the voltage can go down. And therefore, the more, um, the, the greater the variation in this signal. When you have the peaks closer together, there's less time for the capacitor to discharge, and so the signal doesn't change as much. Okay? So more peaks are better for smoother signals. So those are the three main types of power supplies that we looked at. Are there any questions about those? Do bridges ever come in more than just four diodes? Yeah, so, um, so a bridge is any circuit that is in that diamond shape. So there's another bridge, um, there's, there's a circuit called a Wheatstone bridge that's made up of four resistors. So, um, so you might have um, a bridge circuit like this. And the reason, and, and then what you would do is you would put a um, positive voltage supply here and then ground down there. And um, what you can do with this type of circuit is you can put, um, you can make these resistors, um, instead of just using a plain resistor, you can use a, a special type of sensor, which is um, a variable resistor that, that changes um, with when, when something bends. So this is called a strain gauge, and it can be used to measure bending in metal or um, shifting in concrete. These are used oftentimes to um, monitor the motion of bridges and things like that, or, or buildings, to see how much buildings sway. So what happens is that these, these are little resistors that are glued onto the surface of a, a piece of metal or other um, structural material. And then when the metal bends, it actually stretches the resistor just a little bit. And when it bends the other way, it compresses the resistor. And that changes this resistance. And um, so what you can do is you can measure the voltages at um, these two points. And then um, when these resistances change, that, that causes these voltages to change. And you can use that to, as your, your signal um, to actually monitor how much this is the resistance is changing, and therefore how much the building is moving. So this is another type of bridge circuit. Yeah. So other questions? Yeah. Is there a particular reason why we draw bridges in the diamond shape instead of just as two sets of two resistors in series, one in the parallel? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I. This is, this is traditional, <laughs> tradition, right? Yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, this is the way that I've always seen it drawn, um, but you're right, you could just as easily represent it as uh, two, two parallel um, sets of resistors like that. Yeah, uh, I don't know why it's drawn that way. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, all right, so 
that was our view. Um, we talked about the three different types of power supplies. So then it's time to go on and talk a little bit about our main topic for today, which is capacitors and inductors. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, what these are and why they're important and then how they work. And then for the lab, like I said, we actually get to make our own. So this is, this is pretty cool. We don't usually get to make our own components in class. So uh, yeah, I always look forward to this lab. All right, so let's start with capacitors. So the, um, so what is a capacitor? A capacitor is really a very simple component. It consists of two, um, two sheets of metal that are close to each other, but separated by a thin layer of insulation. So if we're looking at this from a side view, this is kind of a cross section of a capacitor. So, um, so these are metal plates here. And then in between the metal plates, there is a thin layer of insulation. And this insulation is known as a dielectric. And basically, the way that capacitors work is you apply a voltage, say a positive voltage on the left and a negative voltage on the right, and that causes um, negative electrons to end up on the, the right side, and they attract positive charges to the left side. And then those negative and positive charges remain even after you remove your applied voltage. So the capacitor stores energy this way. And then that energy can later be released if you provide a path for the electrons to flow from one side of the capacitor to the other. So that's what a capacitor is. So why are they important? Well, capacitors have many different applications in electronics. We've already seen a couple of them um, during the semester, right? We've seen that capacitors can be used as filters, right? We saw in the, the power supplies that they could act kind of like reservoirs to, to store the energy and release it when necessary. Um, we saw that capacitors can allow high frequencies to pass through them, but block out or absorb low frequencies. So um, if you want, you can put them between two parts of a circuit where you want the high frequencies to go through, but block out the low frequencies, like we saw in our, um, in our communicators. So um, capacitors can be used as filters that way. Capacitors can also be used to store and deliver power. So they can, capacitors are starting to be used to replace batteries. So has anybody heard of a supercapacitor? Okay. Yeah, so supercapacitors are essentially very large capacitors. They, they can hold a lot of energy. So the reason that supercapacitors are, are interesting is um, basically they can, they can be charged and discharged much more quickly than batteries can. So, you know, if you're charging up your um, battery for your cell phone, it might take a couple hours. Um, if you're charging up a battery pack for a car, it might take overnight. If you're charging a capacitor, 
it can be done in a matter of seconds. So super, super fast. And capacitors have a much, much longer life than batteries. So you know your cell phone battery works great at first, but then after a year or two, it, it doesn't hold its charge as long. Um, and so it has to be replaced. That's common across almost all types of batteries. They have a pretty short lifespan of a year, a couple years maybe, where they, they're performing at their peak and then they have to be um, replaced. Whereas capacitors can go for years and years and years without, without losing their um, charge holding ability. So they are much faster and much more um, long lived than batteries. So those are, those are a couple of huge advantages. The main drawback for capacitors right now is that they can't store um, as much energy as a battery can. So if you have a battery and a capacitor and they're both the same size, the battery is going to hold a lot more energy than that capacitor. That's how it is right now. But supercapacitors are starting to change that. Supercapacitors are um, starting to be able to hold more and more energy in a, a given amount of volume. So, um, so they're going towards replacing batteries. And maybe someday in the not too distant future, um, we will see applications where you're using capacitors instead of batteries. In fact, there, there are already some applications like that for um, things that only need a small amount of energy. So um, things like certain uh, solar lights and things like that um, can use supercapacitors. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll see uh, capacitors doing more and more of that in the near future. So, so those are a couple of applications for capacitors. Um, let's see, anything else? Um, yeah. Um, oh yeah, one other important circuit that capacitors are used in is called a tank circuit. So a tank circuit is a circuit that includes an inductor and a capacitor. So um, we'll talk about inductors in a minute, but a tank circuit looks something like this. And the interesting thing about a tank circuit is that it resonates. Um, and what that means is that if you put in a signal at a particular frequency, this um, essentially amplifies that signal. So this is a very useful circuit to have um, when you're looking at things like radio. Because when you are looking at a radio signal, people are broadcasting radio transmissions over a huge spectrum of different frequencies. And if you tried to listen to all of those signals all at the same time, it would just be garbage. You couldn't tell what was going on. It'd be like listening to you know, 10 or 100 different conversations at once. You couldn't tell what was happening. So what we want with radio is we want to be able to pick out a very narrow band and only listen to that one particular band. So a tank circuit is great for that. You, it resonates at a very particular frequency. So it will amplify that one small frequency and get rid of the whatever is nearby. So this type of tank circuit is used often in radio receivers. Um, and the frequency of resonance is determined by the capacitor value and the inductor value. So normally what would happen is that you would use a variable capacitor in this circuit. And then you could turn a knob and change that capacitance a little bit. And that would change the resonant frequency and that's how you would tune in different frequencies from your radio. Okay, so this, this tank circuit is another application where capacitors are very useful. So those are a couple of um, reasons why we care about capacitors. So any questions about that? <laughs>
All right, and then let's talk about how capacitors actually work. So this is the, the general idea, but there are three main things that determine capacitance. So number one is the size of the plates. These metal plates store up the electrons and the positive charges. So it kind of makes sense that a bigger plate would have more room to hold electrons and would result in higher capacitance. So that's, that's what happens. The bigger the plate is, the more capacitance you have. Okay. Number two is the distance between the plates. The closer these plates are to each other, the closer the, the charges are going to be together. And so the, the stronger that attraction is going to be from the negative charges to the positive charges. So the closer these plates are together, the more capacitance you get, because those, those charges hold on to each other more strongly. But again, this is another one of those trade-offs, because the closer these things are together, the stronger that attraction is, and the more that the electrons want to jump across this, this insulation to the other side. And if that, that force is strong enough, the electrons will find a way to get through and, and will, will break through that um, insulation, and that can cause damage or destruction to your capacitor. So if you put these things too close together, the electrons find a way across and your capacitor fails. Um, so the, the closer they are together, you get more capacitance, but you don't want it too close where they're actually going to fail. Okay? So it's, it's a trade-off. And then finally, the third thing that affects capacitance is the dielectric material. Remember, the dielectric is this insulator between the plates. And different materials have different properties and they can result in different amounts of capacitance. So those are the three main factors that determine capacitance. So any questions about that? Okay. So then let's go on and talk a little bit about inductors. So an inductor is a very, very simple component. An inductor is just a coil of wire. So every inductor is just a coil of wire, and every coil of wire is an inductor, whether you want it to be or not. Okay? So, so that's that's really all an inductor is. It's just just a coil of wire. Um, so you might wonder, well, why are we so interested in inductors? Why, why would we care about a coil of wire? Um, the answer is that a coil of wire is, it, an inductor, it has properties that are kind of the opposite of a capacitor. So remember, a capacitor allows high frequencies to go through, but it blocks out or absorbs low frequencies. Well, an inductor does the opposite. So, um, so an inductor allows low frequencies to pass through, but it blocks out or absorbs high frequencies. What that means is that we can use inductors in filters kind of the way that we used 
capacitors in filters. Yeah. Does that make the tank circuit sort of like a bandpass filter? Um, so, uh, kind of. I mean, it 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 has this resonant peak. So you could say that the frequencies near that peak pass through. So you could say that it's a very narrow bandpass filter. Yeah, yeah, and and it actually kind of amplifies the the frequencies around that peak as well. Yeah. Um, so, so we can use, yeah, inductors in filters. Um, so we said that if you built a circuit with a capacitor like this, and so this was your input on the left, and then you have an output here on the right, this capacitor allows high frequencies to go through, but it blocks low frequencies. So this would be a high pass filter. If you built a similar circuit, but you put an inductor in there instead, um, so, so this capacitor filter was a high pass filter. If you built the same circuit but replaced the capacitor with the inductor, now the, capac the inductor um, allows low frequencies to go through, but it blocks or absorbs high frequencies. So this would be a low pass filter. So um, inductors can be used in filters. They can be used in tank circuits like we already saw. Um, they, they can also, um, they can be, they're used in automotive industry. So um, if anybody's worked on an, uh, a car engine, like an internal combustion engine, a normal car engine, you may have heard of coils. And these coils, are used to create a high voltage spark that goes to the spark plug that ignites the gas in the cylinders. So a coil is literally all just what it sounds like. It's a coil of wire. And what do we call a coil of wire? It's an inductor. So coils are, coils inside of cars are inductors. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about why they work in just a second. But, but that's another example of where inductors are found. And then another, uh, yet another example is, um, it has to do with electric motors. So remember we said, we talked about electric motors at the beginning of the year, and we said that they were made out of electromagnets. They had electromagnets in them and then permanent magnets in them. And we said an electromagnet is a coil of wire that's usually wrapped around some sort of metal form. And we said just now that every coil of wire is an inductor, whether you want it to be or not. So um, these coils of wire, these electromagnets inside of motors, behave as inductors because they, they are inductors, um, even though it's not, not always convenient have it that way. It is an inductor because it is a coil of wire. And so if we want to understand the behavior of these magnets, we have to understand a little bit about inductors. So these are all places where inductors are used in the real world. So that's why it's helpful to know a little bit about them. So let's talk a little bit about why, why coils of wire are interesting, why they're worth looking at, and, and why it's not just you know, why it's different than just a long straight piece of wire. So basically, um, let's see. Let me do this over here. OK. So what happens, imagine that you have a long straight piece of wire, and you put um, a voltage across that wire 
so that electricity starts to flow. So these little electrons start flowing through this wire. They're moving in this direction. When electricity starts to flow like this, it actually creates a magnetic field. So when the electricity is flowing through the wire like this, it creates a magnetic field that goes around the wire like this. Now, when you have a single wire like this, that um, magnetic field is pretty weak, okay? but it's there. So anytime electricity flows through a wire, it creates this magnetic field. And it turns out that if you put another wire nearby and you create a magnetic field near this second wire, that magnetic field actually causes an electric current in that second wire. So, so this magnetic field that we're getting from the first one actually causes an electric current to flow through this second wire. And it's flowing in the same direction. But what happens when we get an electric current flowing through a wire? What does it create? A magnetic field, exactly. So this, when we create this current in the second wire, that current actually creates its own magnetic field. Okay? And since this, this current that's flowing through the first wire is now kind of dragging this current along through the second wire, it, it makes it a little bit more difficult for the first current to flow because um, it, it's essentially moving itself and it's pulling along these other electrons as well. Now, if we had another wire close by, we'd get the same effect again. The magnetic field from the second wire would create a current in the third wire and that current in the third wire would create its own magnetic field Okay, and if we had another wire, you'd get the same thing again. You'd get another another um, electric current and another magnetic field, and so on. So when and and every time you add on another wire, you're adding on more electrons that have to get moving, and so you're making it more and more difficult for the current to start or to, to flow through the first wire because now this current isn't just moving itself, it's dragging along the current in the second wire which is dragging along the current in the third wire and dragging along in the fourth wire and so on. So the more wires you have close to each other, the harder it is to make the electricity start to move in any of them because it's having to drag all the others along with it. And the thing is that a coil of wire is essentially kind of just a bunch of wires that are, are laid out in a row close to each other. So this effect that we just talked about is happening every time you have a coil of wire. So um, when you have this coil of wire, and you try to get the electricity to start flowing through it, you're, you're pushing electrons through this, this wire, and that's creating a magnetic field. And then that, that um, field is starting to drag along the electrons in the second coil which creates its own magnetic field and has to drag the electrons in the third wire and so on. So, so this coil is experiencing the same effect as you would have if you just had a bunch of wires next to each other. So basically what it means is that it, when you have a coil of wire, it's hard to get the electricity to start moving because it has to drag along all these other electrons. And 
once, once you've been pushing on this for a while, the electricity will, will start to move and eventually it'll kind of settle down into a, you know, a, a sort of a steady state amount of flow. And then at that point, it's not difficult to move the electricity through the coil anymore. It's, it's all moving at a constant rate. Um, basically, it's, it's, all, it's all going, it's doing its thing, it's happy. Um, you don't have to, to push hard anymore. But, but what happens when you try to stop that electricity? Well, if you try to stop the electricity up here, the electricity in this, this top coil um, is essentially being dragged along by the electrons in the, the coil next to it. And those are being dragged along by the coil below that, and so on and so forth. So it's really, once you get the electricity settled down into kind of a nice steady state flow, it's hard to make it stop again, okay? So it's hard to get it moving at first, and then once it's moving, it's hard to make it stop. So, so that's why, um, that's why inductors resist changes in current. They, they allow low frequencies to go through. Remember, a low frequency is kind of a steady state thing. So, so if you get a steady state flow going, it, it's happy about that. But if you try to change things fast, the inductor doesn't let that happen. It, it makes it really difficult because you're trying to, you know, push electrons in one direction while the other ones are, are going the other way and, and it, it doesn't work, okay? So electro inductors allow low frequencies to go through, but they block out or absorb high frequencies. So let's look at the example of the coils in your car um, that we talked about earlier. So we said that the coil in the car is used to create a high voltage which can then create a spark and ignite the gas in your cylinder. So let's see how that works. So what happens is that you put a relatively low voltage onto this coil, say 12 volts that are coming out of your uh, car battery, and that low voltage pushes this electricity through the coil and it makes it um, go around and um, eventually, it's a little hard to get it started, but it comes to kind of a steady state flow. Okay. But then what happens is that the car um, flips a switch, essentially. So it, it disconnects this coil from, from the battery. So now there's this, this break, and the coil is no longer attached to the battery. But it still had this electricity flowing through it. So what happens is that this electricity, it doesn't stop immediately because it's in this coil and it's kind of being dragged around and around by the, the other electricity that's there. So what happens is that um, the electricity that was flowing through, these electrons keep moving and what you get is you get these electrons kind of piling up at one end. So, so they all flow down to this one end and they flow away from the other end. So up at this top end, they're, they're flowing away, so you end up with positive charges up here. Um, and these, these negative charges keep on flowing around, and they end up on the other side. So you end up with lots of positive charges on one side of the coil and lots of negative charges on the other side. And that's a high voltage, okay? And so that's how this coil creates this high voltage and when you connect that to a spark plug, it creates a spark and it ignites the gas inside your cylinder. So that's how a coil inside of an electric, or inside of a car works and how it creates that high, high voltage, okay? Now let's think about a, um, an electric motor, okay? So we said that an electric motor has a bunch of electromagnets inside of it. And these electromagnets are essentially coils that are wrapped around um, a, a metal form. And these coils, what happens with these coils is that you, you attach the, um, you connect electricity to them, right? 
and then um, the electricity flows through the coil and it, it turns on that electromagnet and then um, at some point you turn off one electromagnet and you um, turn on the next electromagnet. So to turn off that electromagnet you essentially open the switch. Now does this look much different from what's going on down here? No. no. In both cases you have this coil where you are connecting a switch and having electricity flow and then disconnecting it and having the electricity, um, the voltage is removed. So down here when we did that, we got this really high voltage. So what do you think is going to happen up here when we do the same thing? You're going to get a high voltage. Exactly. Exactly. Um, now down here it was nice and convenient. We wanted that high voltage to create our spark inside of our uh, motor. Up here it's not so convenient because we, we don't really want a high voltage inside of a piece of electronics. But convenient or not, this, it happens. And oftentimes people don't, don't take this into account. Um, and that can have really bad consequences. In fact, um, this, this actually happened in a real world example. I was working at a, a company in San Diego and they were building a, a robot and it had electric motors in it and these motors um, would move a little robot head around and pick up samples and, and um, deposit them in different places. Now, <laughs> kind of, yeah. It was a benchtop thing and it, it would pick up little samples of liquid and, and move it around to a different plate. Um, but it, the, the robot used a number of motors that had these um, coils in them, as all electric motors do, and the designer um, hadn't accounted for the high voltage spikes that happen when these um, switches are disconnected. So the company built all these, a bunch of these robots, you know, several hundred of them, they shipped them out to customers, um, and the customers got them and they were working fine at first, but then pretty soon the robots started to fail. They were having parts that, um, that were getting blown out because of high voltage spikes and they couldn't, they couldn't figure out why. And eventually it turned out it was because of these motors. These motors were creating these high voltage spikes when they were being turned off and um, because of that the company had to recall a bunch of their robots and repair them and, and fix them so that they, they um, no longer had this issue. So it's a real world thing and um, if, it's, if it's not taken care of it can um, result in, in serious damage. Yeah? How can the voltage build up be accounted for in things like that? Yeah, so, um, so the, the fix for this is that there are um, there, well if the electricity only has to flow in one direction, then the fix is um, relatively easy. What you can do is you can just put in a normal diode. So you put a diode in like that. Um, and then when you have a positive voltage up here, um, the electricity can't flow through the diode because it's reverse biased. It all flows through this um, coil, but then um, if the electricity is disconnected and you, you end up with a lot of positive charges down here, um, then the diode becomes forward biased and they just flow through the, the diode and you don't get a big voltage there. Um, so if the electricity is flowing just in one direction, you can use a normal diode like that. If the electricity has to flow in both directions, like you need a motor that can turn left and right, then you need to use um, a special diode called a Zener diode. Um, and a, a Zener diode, um, the symbol is like this. Basically, if it's, if it's forward biased, it acts like a normal diode. Um, and it allows 
uh, electricity to flow through in that direction. And um, you have about a 0.7 volt drop across it. If it's reverse biased, then it has a, a predetermined um, voltage limit. And below that limit, no electricity can flow through it. But above that limit, um, it, it basically allows only that much, elect uh, that much voltage to go through. So, so you could have like a, a so say you know that you want to put um, 12 volts up here. You could choose a 15 volt uh, Zener diode. You put one there like that. You put another one um, in the reverse direction. Um, and then anything below 15 volts would not flow through the diode. Anything 15 volts or above, current would start to flow through that diode. And um, so it would limit, essentially, the voltage across this coil to 15 volts. Um, if there were no diode, this, the voltage from a, just an unprotected coil can get up into the, the hundreds of volts. So, um, so this is a much better option. So that, that would be the kind of circuit that you would use to protect against that motor. And that's what they did um, at the company where I worked. They had to install these things. So, yeah. What's your favorite kind of diode? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good question. There's actually a lot of different kinds. Um, I'd, I don't think that I have a favorite. <laughs> there's, there's something called a tunnel diode that has like a reverse um, resistance capability. How does that work? Right? So normally, um, with resistors, you know, the more current you get, the more voltage you get across it, right? That's Ohm's law, V equals IR. With these special kinds of diodes in a certain region, the more current you get, the less voltage you end up with. So it's, it's like an, a reverse resistor. So that's kind of cool. But anyway. Is it made up with some sort of different filament that the, it's it's um, it's all because of quantum, okay? <laughs> right. There there are these quantum effects um, between these uh, two pieces of silicon, and um, basically that's a fancy way of saying I don't know exactly how it works, <laughs> but but there yeah there are two pieces of uh, it's it's pretty exotic stuff and quantum yeah quantum mania there you go yeah so yeah. Um, all right, so, so that's a little bit about inductors. So remember, any, any coil of wire is an inductor, whether you want it to be or not. So the last thing I wanted to say about inductors was that there is this particular formula that we can use to calculate inductance. So Um, say we have an inductor and it's this coil wire and um, we wanted to find the inductance. We would say that L, which is short for inductance, equals n squared times a over little l um, times some constants. Where um, n is the number of coils A is the cross-sectional area. So up here in this diagram, A would be the, the area of one coil. <coughs> 
that would be A. And then um, little l down here is the length of the coil. Um, it might be good to have it for the final. Okay. Um, I don't think that you're going to have to use it to um, to calculate something, but it might be good to know the formula. Just know what the formula is. Right. So. So L is the in, this is the inductance formula okay. for for an inductor. So L is the inductance. It's equal to n squared times a over little l times some constants, where n is the number of coils, a is the cross-sectional area, and l is the length of the inductor here. So, so you can see that um, in this formula, n, capital N, the number of coils, is one of the most important factors because that's squared. So the more coils you have, the, the bigger the inductance. So, and if you doubled the coils, you'd get four times the inductance. Doubled the number of coils, you get four times the inductance. Okay. Um, and then A is the cross-sectional area. Um, so the larger the area you have, the more inductance you end up with. And then um, little l is the length. And you can see that we're dividing by little l. So in other words, the longer the coil is, the less inductance you have. And this kind of makes sense um, if I think about it this way. So imagine we have two coils. Each one of them has 10 turns in it. One of those coils is, is very short. It's only you know an inch long. That, and then the other one is like, um, say, two inches long. The one that's only an inch long, those, those coils of wire are going to be a lot closer to each other. And so the, when the electricity is flowing through them, one coil is going to have a much greater effect on the next one because it's going to be closer to the next one. So the, the shorter the coil is, the closer those turns are going to be to each other and the more they're going to affect each other. Okay? So that's why a longer coil is going to have less inductance. Right. And then um, there are some constants here that have to do with um, like the whatever this thing is wrapped around and you know the material that you're using and um, stuff like that. So um, this formula isn't it's a little a little weird to use it you know on a, a single coil that you've never seen before and try and calculate the inductance of that because it's hard to tell exactly what these constants are. But it can be useful for comparing two coils that are similar to each other. So like I said, if you have two coils that are the same but one is longer, you can tell that this formula will say that the, the shorter one is going to have more inductance. Or two similar coils um, but one has more turns, the one with more turns is going to have more inductance. So this is good for comparing similar coils to each other. All right. So, uh, any questions about that? Size material, what are some other problems? Um, I think like the, the thickness of the uh, wire might be another one. Um, stuff like that, yeah. So, yeah, other questions? Okay, all right. So that's the formula for an inductance. So then let's go on and do a preview of today's lab, OK? So in the lab today, we're going to get to make our own capacitors and inductors. So this is pretty cool. Um, this, is, this is always a lot of fun. So, um, so No, no, it's a single day. It shouldn't take too long. Um, so let's talk about making a, um, an inductor first, OK? So we said an inductor is just a coil of wire, and every coil of wire is an inductor. So that's what we're going to do. Um, 
So everybody is going to be given um, some wire. It's going to look kind of like this. Um, this, this is, it's it's just some wire, oh. and it's wrapped around a piece of cardboard. Okay. Okay. Just to hold it. Um, now this wire will appear red. Basically, it's copper wire that has this thin red layer of insulation on the outside. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this wire and we're just going to wrap it around a, a nail. The nail is going to be our form and we're just going to um, wrap this wire up. That's all there is to it. And we're going to be making this coil of wire. No, actually, I take that back. We're going we're gonna to wrap this around um, a drinking straw. So, um, so we're going to take this, this wire and just make a, a coil around a drinking straw. So nothing too fancy, except that I've now tied my wire into a knot here. All right. Okay, so you're going to take it and you're just going to wrap it up like this. And then um, when we're all done, we're actually going to measure the inductance of this coil. So when you're wrapping this up, you just want the coils to be pretty close to each other, the, the turns to be pretty close, um, because that'll like give you, touching. yeah, yeah, they can be touching because it's got this layer of um, insulation all around your wire. All right, now, okay. So I've made this wire coil. So I've, I've created an inductor here. Now we want to measure the inductance. Now, in order to do that, we need to remove the insulation from the ends of this, these wires, okay? So um, everybody will get, there will be a little piece of sandpaper like this that you can use. And um, you're just going to try and rub the, the ends of the wire on the sandpaper a little bit and try and get rid of that insulation as much as possible. Okay? So when you're done, you should see the, the end of your wire has kind of a, it, it should look kind of um, coppery. It should look like copper without that red coating around it. That way uh, you'll know that you've gotten the insulation off. Okay? So you're going to do that for both sides of this wire. And now, after that, you're going to use um, the you're going to use the meter to measure the inductance of this wire. Now, remember when we when we measured capacitance, we had to use those two little um, slots in the meter. And we're going to have to do that when we measure inductance as well. Because remember, inductance is just, an inductor is just a coil of wire. And we, if we have those long leads, they might be coiled up and they might have their own inductance. So um, we want to avoid that. So we're going to use those two little slots to measure inductance. So, um, 
So the unit of inductance is Henry's. So we're going to turn the dial over into this top left quadrant where um, we see that H for Henry's. So um, we'll start off in the lowest setting here. And then we're going to try to push these little wires into these thin, um, into these, these little uh, slots. If you can get the, the wires to go in there, that's great. Um, these wires are so thin that they might not actually make a good connection there. Well, so that's, okay, so there you go. So that's about 0.02 um, millihenries, okay? So then once, okay, so you can see that it's about 0.02 millihenries. And once you do that, you're going to take this nail and you're going to put that inside the form. And you can see that when I do that, that increases the inductance. Remember the, the core, the thing that the inductor is wrapped around is one of those constants that affects the inductance. So when you have a metal core, you can see you have more inductance. When we move that metal core out, the inductance goes down. So you could actually make a tunable inductor this way. You could, you could use a core and move it in and out to create different amounts of inductance, okay? So, so that's going to be the first part of the lab. And then the second part of the lab is you're going to create your own capacitor. Um, and so the way that this is going to work is that you're going to start with a, a pencil. And this is going to be your form. And then um, you're going to take two sheets of metal and two sheets of paper and you're going to make a sandwich. So you're going to start with a sheet of paper and then put a sheet of tin foil on top and you're going to have another uh, sheet of paper on top of that and another sh sheet of tin foil on top of that. And you can tape these together to, to hold them in place. Okay, I actually recommend doing that. Taping, taping everything together, hold it in place and then you can tape that whole bundle onto a pencil. Now when you do this it, a couple of things are important to note. Um, first of all the the tin foil should be um, it should not be hanging off the the top side of your paper. There should be some gap there um, because we're going to wrap these we're going to wrap these all up around a pencil, and um, we don't want the, the two pieces of tinfoil to be touching each other on the inside there, okay? So the tinfoil should not be touching the top. It should be away from the sides. Um, it can be hanging off the bottom. In fact, it, it should be hanging off the bottom a little bit because we're going to attach um, to those hanging off parts a little bit later on. So now. You can have your sandwich here. Like I said, I would, I would tape all the parts together so that they, they stay. Um, and then you're going to start wrapping everything around this pencil. Um, so we're going we're gonna to wrap this all up. And you want it to be a fairly tight wrap here. And then when you're all done, you're going to end up with this, this roll of paper and you should have the two pieces of tin foil sticking out the end. So this is actually a capacitor. Remember, a capacitor is just two sheets of metal separated by a thin layer of insulation. In this case, your metal is your tin foil and the insulation is the paper that you got there. So then um, what we're going to do now is we're going to measure the capacitance of our homemade capacitor. And we're going to use these two little slots to do that again, but there's really no way that you're going to get your tin foil to fit into those slots. So instead, what you're going to do is you're going to take jumper wires and you're going to push one jumper wire into each 
one of these little slots. Okay. And then um, you're going to attach an alligator clip to each of your jumper wires. So So we'll take one alligator clip and attach it to the, the left one, and then a second alligator clip and attach it to the right. And then you're going to take those alligator clips and you're going to use um, one clip for each of the pieces of foil. So one clip goes there, the other clip attaches to the other piece of foil. And then you're going to move your dial over into the F setting for farads. So we're going to move the dial over there. Um, and then, yep, if all goes well, you should see a reading for how many um, farads your capacitor has. And then um, once you get that reading, you're going to record that in your lab book. And then you're going to let the um, you're going to let the capacitor unwind a little bit. So if you just kind of loosen your grip on it, it should unwind a little bit and we'll see the capacitance change hopefully. So here we go. We're going to loosen it up a little bit, up, and the capacitance changed there. Okay? And we loosen it a little bit more and the capacitance changes again. Okay? So, and then you're going to record that in your lab book as well. So that's how you're going to make your own, um, your own capacitor and your own inductor. Okay. Um, I believe so. So this lab starts on page uh, page one seventy three. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. And then there's a couple of questions at the end of the lab. And yeah, that's it. Is there a formula to measure out uh, capacitance? Um, no, there's not really a formula for that. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Is the smoothness of the conductive material in the capacitor and I They're both important. So the, the Remember, there's the three main things that affect capacitance. The, hey, can we hang on just one second, guys? We're, we're just got one more question here. So there's three main things that affect the capacitance. There's the, the surface area of the, the plates, the distance between the plates, and then the, the dielectric material. So, so all of those things do impact the capacitance. Yeah. Other questions? All right, then let me take attendance, and I'll let you go.